birth of Jesus Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, and before they came together, she was allowed to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. May the Lord add his blessing to you and hear it his holy word. man who was always worrying, he was worrying about his children, about his job, about his wife, about his health, and one day a friend looked at him and noticed that he was extremely calm and peaceful, and he said, Mike, why are you so calm? You always worry about everything. What, what happened? What changed? And the former warrior replied, oh, I just hired a guy to do all my worrying for me. And the friend asked, well, how, how much are you paying this guy? He said, a thousand dollars a week. A thousand dollars a week? You can't afford a thousand dollars a week? The word responded, well, that's his problem, isn't it? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if you could find some poor sack that you could unload all of your worries on? No pun intended. <laughs> but if there is just somebody that we can throw everything at, just take everything that I'm worrying about and put it on them so that I don't have to experience it anymore, wouldn't that be great? Is there anybody here that doesn't experience or have to deal with worry sometimes in their lives? You just, you've really got this down and you never have to deal with it. Because I'm guessing if you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I think I've got this one handled, then, then I'm guessing that you don't worry, you just have remained it. You're thinking very deeply. I'm just highly concerned. It's not worry, I'm just really, really, really concerned. And you're not fooling anybody because all of us have worries. We have worries. We worry about different things. See, each one of them are, are different. Some of them are very, very, very similar, though. Are we going to be able to pay the bills? How am I going to get all of this stuff done? Especially around Christmas season, this seems to be uh, uh, a uh, common worry. So-and-so is sick. Are they going to be okay? I'm worried about the problems that I'm having with my uh, spouse or with my family or with my kids or with my parents or with my boss. What if I get sick? What if I fail my test? What if I catch on fire again? What if nobody laughs at my jokes? <laughs> I worry about that a lot. <laughs> Where is a part of our everyday lives? And when we look back to this first Christmas story, it's really easy to see how it would have been become very easy for the people involved in this story, especially Mary herself, to become very worried about what lay before her. I'm going to tell you what I mean. So let's start off by praying. Dear God, I thank you for today, God. Um, and I thank you for this great Christmas story and, and how we can preach this story all year, God, and still only scratch the surface. So I ask that you would help us as we look into this aspect of the story just to, uh, to be able to apply it to our own lives, to learn and to apply. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's how our scripture today starts off. It starts off and says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but be before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now, we're, we're familiar with that. We hear that over and over in our heads, and, you know, you, you can usually kind of even finish it in your mind as we get through it. But in order to get insight into what happened, what really happened back then, you really have to, to tear apart the verse and kind of break it down so you can get a better picture of the story. So listen again. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. 
Now when you look at this section, especially this phrase, she was found to be with child. And then you, you go back to the original language and you put it in the context of the story, we get a picture of what most likely happened by putting together all of the accounts of the uh, birth of Jesus. Um, Mary is told by an angel that she is going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and that she's going to give birth to the Christ child. She's also told that her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant right now as they speak. So Mary goes out and she visits Elizabeth and she stays there for three months. Mary travels, goes away, stays with Elizabeth for three months. And the question is why? Why did she go away for three months? Well, think about it. If you were told that you were going to be pregnant with God's baby, how would you break the news to your future husband? Did you ever think about this? Did you ever think about that conversation? I'm sure that when Mary went out there and she was talking with Elizabeth, this was something that they discussed and they discussed frequently. I mean, she's going out to somebody who's, you know, is pregnant at the same time. She's a confident, you know, how do I tell this to Joseph? How, how do I do this? And I'm sure why she's out there with, uh, with Elizabeth, she has all of the what ifs going through her mind that we tend to uh, let run loose when, when we have uh, a future that is uncertain. And I'm sure that she's running through with these with Elizabeth. What if he doesn't believe me, Elizabeth? What if he thinks I'm lying? What if I dreamt the whole thing up? What if my parents disown me? What if I'm not a fit mother of God's child? And the list goes on and on and on of what ifs that Mary could have been asking Elizabeth. And I promise you that Mary had many sleepless nights just thinking about her future and how uncertain it was right now. And it's only after three months that Mary finally comes back to town. She stays with Elizabeth for three months and comes back. So most likely, it's three months since she's seen Joseph. And do you know at what point a woman's body generally starts to show that they're pregnant? Do you know at what point that is? You probably don't because most women would like you to believe that it's the next day. Right, ladies? I don't want to call you out on this, but you say, my pants, they're not tight because I ate a half gallon of ice cream last night. I am three days pregnant. <laughs> that's what they, they want you to believe it's like snap. That's that's where the weight's coming from. Yeah, that's it. Generally around the third month. The third month is where a woman begins to show, begins to show signs of being pregnant. Which is most likely right around the time that Mary comes back to see Joseph. So Mary notices that that, that she's got the little uh, baby bump and she decides, okay, it, it's time. I gotta go back and see him. And she comes back to see Joseph. And scripture says that she was found to be with child. It doesn't say she told Joseph that she was with child. It says scripture says she was found to be with child. With child. So most likely Joseph notices that, that Mary is beginning to show. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that would have been an extremely awkward conversation. You ever been there? You know what I'm talking about? Did you ever see somebody whose stomach looks a little bit bigger than the last time you saw them? And, you know, you're just wondering. Did you ever walk right up to this person, rub their belly, and say, How far along are you? This ever happened to you? Yeah, why not? Because you will die. You will die. They will kill you if they are not pregnant. You don't do that. You don't. This is the only thing that you learn out of today. Learn this because this may save your life. Never, ever walk up to a woman and ask her if she is pregnant. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Did you hear me? Don't do it. It's not something that you do. So Joseph, you know, he notices that that Mary is a little bit larger, and you can just picture this being an awkward, awkward conversation, and, and and Joseph saying, um. Was the food really good at Elizabeth's house? Um, you know, did, 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 is it better out there? Maybe you eat too much fried food? What, what, what's going on? Most likely notices the signs, and we don't know exactly how the conversation goes, but, but put yourself in Joseph's shoes. So he notices, he asks her, and what does she tell him? I'm pregnant. He says, well, okay, who's the dad? And what does she say? God. How do you think that went? I mean, really, how do you think that went? Okay, so you're pregnant. Who are you pregnant with? God's child? Okay. <laughs> what do you say to that? How do you respond to that? I am pregnant with God's child. I mean, are you, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Are you going to believe her? Yes, I, I did. The Holy Spirit came down and, and put baby Jesus in my belly. And when we think of Joseph, 
he had he responded. We know how he responded, and there were two poss two possible reasons of why he responded to this. First of all, he could have believed her. He could have said, "Oh, you're pregnant with God's child. Well, I I didn't sign up for this. I'm not holy enough to be the, the father of God's child. I'm just going to take a step back and and you handle it." That's the first option. But the second option is a lot more likely. The second second option is he probably felt that she was being dishonest with him, and that for one reason or another, whether it be of her free will or not, she committed adultery and. and it was before they were married that she's no longer fit to be his wife. And this is probably what's going through Joseph's mind because of this he's left with a couple of options. Option one, here's the three options that he could have. Option one, he could pursue it to the fullest extent of the law and he could have her scope. He could. This wasn't the most common thing that he did back then, but it was definitely something that was possible. So he could have Mary Stone for doing this. Option two, which is a lot more likely than what most people pursued, he could publicly divorce her. And what this meant was he would take her into the public arena. Everybody would, be, would, would know that this was happening. The community would show up. He would lay all the allegations down against her. She would be uh, convicted as being guilty. She would be labeled a harlot. And nobody would have anything to do with her for the rest of her life. Even her family would disown her. Or option number three, he could privately divorce her. He could have two witnesses show up, just two people. They would uh, get a private divorce um, and sp spread their own separate ways, but the community would not label her a harlot, and, and they would never know exactly why they uh, split up, which would be the easiest of the three. However, all three of them come with uh, a consequence. And we reach a part in the story where Mary's worries have come to fruition. This is what she was worried about. What would Joseph do? What would Joseph say? How am I going to respond if he says that, that he's no longer going to be my husband? Um, and she has all of this going through her mind. And some of the options of how this is going to play out are better than others. But regardless, all of, all of them are going to be some form of a punishment to Mary. And the thing that she's worried about is coming to pass. And that's something that we have to remember. Sometimes the things that we worry about may happen someday. They may. Everyone that you know sadly will die. Everyone will pass away. You very well at some point in time may struggle with financial problems. You might even battle cancer or something just as difficult in your life. There are things that we worry about sometimes that we may have to face. Mary had to face the confusion of her husband over what happened, and she was worried about how he would respond to her being pregnant. And she was fearing that this could come back to haunt her. But you've got to understand, guys, sometimes we face it, but this is the exception. This is not the rule. Let me give you a breakdown of our words. Here is 100% of what we worry about. There's a study was taken, looked at what we worry about, and then broke it down like this. 40% of the things that we worry about will never happen. 40% of them will never happen. 30% of the things that we worry about are things from the past that we cannot change. So we're up to 70% of worries that are, that are pretty much irrelevant. 12% are about criticisms from others, which are mostly untrue. 10% is about our health, which just happens to get worse when we worry about it. And 8%, 8% of the things that we worry about are about things that may actually be faced. 8%, less than 1 in 10 of our worries are about things that we might face. And most of the time, the things that we worry about, they're not real. They're not real. We'll never have to deal with them. They, they, sometimes they don't even make sense. For example, I'm worried about carrots. Anybody else worried about carrots? Just, just me. Okay. Maybe it's because you've never put all the facts together before. Let me tell you. You might, you might be worried about carrots, but maybe if you're listening to these, um, don't laugh at me yet. Fact number one. Nearly all sick people have eaten carrots. <laughs> never thought about that before, did you? Huh? Yeah, fact number two, an estimated 99.9% .9 of people that die from cancer and heart disease have eaten carrots in the last six months. Still not convinced? Fact number three, 99% of people involved in car crashes ate carrots within 60 days of their accidents. Starting to get worried now, aren't you? Trying to count back how long ago was you ate carrots before you get out there to get your vehicle, right? <laughs> 93.1% of juvenile delinquents come from homes where carrots are served regularly. Fact number five, among people born in 1839 who later ate carrots, there has been a 100% mortality rate. <laughs> Anybody else scared about carrots now? 
Yeah? <laughs> no? Why not? Do you think carrots are deadly? No. Yeah. Yes, yes, I got it, as Mitchell does. <laughs> But this is the problem with worrying. This is what we do. We take things that aren't real. We take things that we're never going to face. We take things that are untrue, or that we can't do anything to change about, or that are completely irrelevant, uh, and we worry about them until we're sick, and until we lose sleep, and, and until we've made ourselves physically ill. I struggled with that this week. That was my big problem that I dealt with this very week. And there is no reason for it. There is no reason for it. Because we get back to the story and we see that Joseph has chosen option number three, hasn't he? It says that Joseph has it in his mind that he's going to privately divorce his wife. So two people show up and they're going to split and now she has to raise this, this child on her own. He's going to quietly divorce her. And there's nothing, there's nothing that Mary can say to change his mind. But Mary's got somebody on her side, right? God usually provides a little bit more of a convincing argument. An angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. Mary was extremely worried about what was going to happen to her. And who fixed it in the end? Yeah, yeah God. God fixed it in the end. God had this planned out from the beginning. God knew where it was going to wind up. And that's what we have to realize. God does take care of our worries. In the end, God will make sure that everything is okay. He's got a plan. And all of the worrying that we do about it doesn't do anything to change the outcome of his plan. Things are going to work out the way that he has planned them to work out. But that's only half the story, guys. I don't want to tell you that you should never worry because it's all going to work out in the end. You don't want to be scared. You don't want to be concerned. Because that's half the story. That's the end. Well, what I worry about is all of the stuff that takes me up to the end. I know the end's going to be okay, but what about all the stuff in the middle, all of the pain, all of the hardship, all of the turmoil that we may have, to, uh, may have to face? I don't get worried about the outcome. I get worried about the process. Because just because just you know it's going to work out in the end doesn't take away the fear of everything that happens between now and then. Just because you believe that God is going to hear you after surgery and, and the surgery is going to be great in the end doesn't mean that you can't be concerned about all the pain that you have to endure between now and then. Just because you know that somebody is going to go to heaven doesn't mean that you can't worry and be concerned about the pain of living without them and what it's like to no longer have them in your life. When Jesus was on the earth, and he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew God's plan. And he knew that in the end, everything was going to work out. He was going to save the world. Yet he was crying. He was crying and he was scared. And what was he afraid of? All of that pain that was to be experienced between now and then. And he called out to God and he said, God, help me deal with this. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to obsess over it. I'm not telling you to make yourself sick about it. But I am telling you, it is okay to be concerned. It is. The key is to not let it grow into something that takes over your life, that makes you sick, and that makes you obsessed. So today, I'm going to give you some practical advice on how to help yourself out when you're experiencing these worries, when you're experiencing these concerns over things that you may someday face in your life. Number one, just remember these guys when we're done. Number one, open up about your worry. What we tend to do with our worries is we take them, we shove them in there, and we think, if I never think about this again, if I pretend like it doesn't exist, then it'll shrink, it'll go away, and I won't have to deal with it. But that's not what happens when we take worry and we shove it down inside. It doesn't get smaller, it gets bigger. It festers, it boils, it grows, and then it begins to take over, it begins to change us. We don't enjoy the things that we used to do. We, we start to make ourselves sick in our free time, no matter what's going on. That's what's on our mind, that's what we're thinking about. And even though we try to push it down, it forces itself right back up. So number one, open up about your worry. You have to make sure that you're letting them out. Talk to somebody about it. Let them know what you're concerned about. Get it out of your mouth. Write it down on paper if you don't have somebody that you feel comfortable in, in confiding in or letting them see how crazy you are about some of these things you're saying, thinking about. Get them down on paper. Mary went to Elizabeth for three months so that she could begin to deal with some of these things, and that's what I'm asking you to do. Number one, if you're worried about something, open up about it. And when you get it out, you will start to immediately feel better. Number two, pray about them after you admit them. After you say, these are what I'm worried about, after you write them down and tell somebody about them, then tell God about them. Say, God, this is what I'm worried about. Help me to deal with this. Help 
me to get past this. So number two is pray about them. Praying about them and admitting that your word doesn't mean that you're lacking in faith. It means that you have enough faith to trust God to get you through. It means that you're normal, that you're not perfect, and just like Jesus did in the garden, you need God's help. Number three, last thing, release them to God. Remember that you cannot carry these burdens with you by yourself. And although you very well may experience some pain between now and then, in the end, God will work it out for you. And he will give you the strength to get through it. So first of all, talk about it. Secondly, pray about it. And then third of all, release it and say, God, I know that you can get me through this. And just like he did for Mary on that very first Christmas, he eliminated her concerns and her worries through Joseph. He will do the same thing for you in your lives if you're strong enough to push through. Let us pray. Dear God, we do struggle with worries, God, but we try to keep them inside. We don't talk about them. We don't pray about them, God. And we think if we just pretend like they're not there, that they'll go away. But that's not how it happens, God. So I ask that you would help us, God. If we are dealing with worries right now, or the next time we deal with worries, God, help us to be honest about them. Help us to write them down. Help us to talk to those around us. Then help us to pray to you for help. And in the end, just to help us to find a way to trust that you have the situation under control. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.